Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to the Saturday Bookshelf, a production of the Shelter and Solidarity Collective. Um, we will ask that when you are not talking, please keep your mics muted. Remember, we're on Zoom, which means if we hear you, we will see you and you will be recorded for future posterity. Um, we will open for audience uh, questions, participation, and discussion around quarter till, between quarter till and the hour. Um, today, our guest is David Higgins. Uh, as an associate professor of English and chair of the Department of Humanities and Communications at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University worldwide uh, in Daytona Beach, uh, where he's recently moved. Congratulations. Um, David's research imp explores imperial fantasy during the Cold War period and beyond. He serves as the science fiction editor for the Los Angeles Review of Books and an associate editor for the Journal for the Fantastic in the Arts and has recently published two books we want to talk about today, uh, Reverse Colonization, Science Fiction, Imperial Fantasy, and Alt-Victimhood with the University of Iowa, and a critical monograph examining Anne Leckie's uh, masterwork, Ancillary Justice, with Paul Grave. Um, we are really lucky to have David with us here today, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, David, um, for folks who might not be as familiar with the idea of colonization and speculative fiction, uh, you've brought in a short video to for us to sort of see to introduce uh, the concept. Uh, would you would you be willing to share this to start us off? Absolutely, yeah. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, and I just wanted to clarify: I'm actually not um, I'm not an associate editor for the JFA for the Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts. Okay. I want those people to have all the credit that they deserve. <laughs> they do great, great work. I'm involved with the IAFA, um, but uh, I, I want the JFA people to know that uh, they are fantastic mm -hmm. and I support them, and they're they're brilliant. Um, so yeah, uh, you asked me to share a clip to kind of start us off, and um. Uh, or or a passage, and as I was thinking about um, you know talking about the book and talking about some of the questions that you might want to raise for the show, I thought that the introduction to the prisoner, right, some of the opening moments from the clip uh, from the television show, the British television show, The Prisoner, uh, can be really great. I'm not going to show the whole intro because it's really long. I'm just going to show you the last part. But right before this, like every episode of The Prisoner starts off pretty much the same, right? What happens? Uh, well, you've got the secret agent played by Patrick McGowan. He's racing toward the heart of London in his sports car, and he storms into an office uh, and he resigns, right? Uh, and, you know, he basically slams down, right? He pounds the desk. Right. There's the sound of crashing thunder and he hands in his resignation letter, presumably like this is like James Bond uh, resigning from the from MI6 or whatever. Right. And then he goes home and he basically he slams a photo into his bag of a sandy tropical beach like I'm out of here. I'm going to go be on a sandy tropical beach somewhere else. Uh, and then gas pours through the keyhole of his front door because they're not going to let him resign, right? And so instead he is knocked out uh, and taken to a place called the village, right? And that's the, then then it always starts with this next bit, which I'll show you here. So let me just go ahead and um, make sure that I've got the video. Okay, so I'm going to make sure I got this here. So we're going to screen share um, and then I will maximize and here we go. Information. 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 You won't get it. By hook or by crook, we will. Who are you? The new number two. Who is number one? You are number six. I am not a number. 
I am a free man! <laughs> All right. So this is a great, this is, I think this sort of sums up uh, so much about reverse colonization and we are all prisoners and victims and uh, all of that kind of jazz. So I thought I'd, I'd share that and open it up with you. I don't know if you wanted me to talk about it, to just jump into talking about it, Mark, or how, how you want to proceed. Oh, no, I think, I think, you know, that's a marvelous clip. And I, and I, I appreciate it a great deal because I think it, it points out some of the complexity of the genre of, of what you're looking at is reverse colonization and some of the complexity of your work, right? Here we have on, um, I mean, I loved The Prisoner. I still love The Prisoner, right? You know, it, it's twisted and decentering and, and a little psychedelic and, you know, and on the one hand, you know, here we have, you know, the oppressed person standing against the establishment of power and the knowing figure, you know, but on the other hand, it's like it's James Bond, who is the oppressed person, right? I mean, we, you know, this guy's been evidently, you know, a foreign agent, he's probably, you know, committed espionage and intrigue, if not assassination, and suddenly, this white well-to-do posh guy, I mean, you know, is suddenly now our representative of the oppressed underdog, I think, and that it, it's sort of mind-blowing, right? The, yeah, we like it, and yet it's really problematic. And that's how I respond to thinking about this clip. Uh, it, what Are those your thoughts as well, or what do you think? Yeah, you sum it up very well, Mark, right? You know, like James Bond, you know, a lot of times we, we might not think of it this way, but like, you know, agent of empire, the secret agent genre, right? It's like you're you're out there doing the work of, you know, James Bond is out there, you know, uh, in, in the Ian Fleming and in the kind of early movies, like he's out there doing the work of empire, right? Uh, when maybe conquest uh, in like naked terms, like he's not out there like colonizing, but he's doing the work of imperial dominance, right? For the state uh, in all these kinds of various ways. And here you have the, the, uh, the secret agent, you know, the kind of icon of, of the, the kind of like masculine, uh, like imperial adventure hero of the Cold War era, you know, resigning and then becoming the prisoner. And I, I, everything that you said, I agree with. That's like, on one hand, I also love the prisoner. I think this show is amazing. And I, as I kind of talk about in the book, I think that like what it's intentionally doing or what it's sort of pointing toward is a critique of what Foucault calls disciplinary society, right? Or the, the you know, in, in Foucault talks about, right? Like the kind of the, the logic of the prison being expressed all throughout, right? Uh, society in the contemporary era, right? You know, the sort of panoptic, we, today we might think of it as being like algorithmically organized or algorithmically kind of like, you know, manipulated subject. We want information from you, right? And we're gonna use that information to manage you uh, in order to like put you into the right consumer category or the right political category in order to do all this sort of stuff. I mean, I, like, so I, I'm, I'm with you. I think like the prisoner is like extraordinary in its critique of the way that we are all, right? Subject to a kind of disciplinary society, right? Uh, set of pressures. Um, and I think it's prescient, right, in, in terms of the way that it, 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 it imagines the way that, like, now all of our private information is being extracted from us in order to turn us into good, uh, you know, like, subjects or whatever, right, of, uh, under late capitalism. But then, and you already said this, like, at the same time, uh, at, at a moment, the late 60s, when law and order discourse in the United States and other things like that are, like, you know, like, what, when we have the kind of expansion of Right, the the prison industrial complex in the United States and and to some extent elsewhere, right? Like increasingly incarcerating like black men of color, especially, and all sorts of others. Like here we have like James Bond, the white adventure hero, is the ultimate sort of prisoner subject, you know. And so from here, I think you can cut straight toward Neo in the Matrix, right? For example, right? Like who needs to unplug in order to reconstitute his heroic white masculinity and and all that kind of stuff you know so i i think that you know the, i think that the prisoner is a really great moment to look at the kind of complicated ways that we're that science fiction is imagining uh or inviting us to think of oneself as being a victim subject to colonizing outside power right uh you know from that moment forward yeah yeah so much to think about and and thinking about the the 
espionage as sort of the superhero of the Cold War 60s, right? And in certain ways, you know, there's a speculative fiction element there. But I think about um, James's Bond's, James Bond's, well, not Casino, but the, you know, the first, the first of the main Connery, the Doctor No, right? Where is he? He's in Jamaica doing the work of maintaining the British Empire, right, against this villain um maintaining you know the the colonies as it were um you have talked in other places sort of about that relationship of speculative fiction and colonialism as sort of the history the history of there and i'm i would would you uh, would you sort of walk us through that sort of complex relationship for for folks who may not be as intimately familiar with that trajectory and who are some of the colonialists and who might be some of the anti-colonialists and who might be caught in between yeah well you know the the story of science fiction's relationship with imperialism and colonialism is of course very complex uh i think john reader uh in his book colonialism and the emergence of science fiction really really lays it out beautifully you know when he argues that you know the the same moment when science fiction sort of came to be as a recognizable genre in the late 1900s and early you know 20th century right or late late 1800s early 1900s right like the in the moment when science fiction was emerging right was also the moment of uh the kind of like the great <laughs> the great race uh to uh, for for euro american right like powers to uh conquer the rest of the globe um, and, you know, Reader, I, I think, really beautifully points out the ways that science fiction has always been um, influenced by and influencing other imperial adventure genres. You know, so at the same time, you know, we think of Edgar Rice Burroughs and things like that, right? Like you, at the same time that we have early science fiction emerging in the kind of like early stories and the pulps and all that, it's borrowing from, you know, American Westerns and British colonial adventure tales like H. Ryder Haggard, you know, science fiction, like uh, horse, space opera, right, is literally taken from horse opera. And there's all sorts of, you know, it's hard to kind of name them because they're just, there's so many pulps uh, from the early, uh, from the early 20th century, especially that were like, you know, Westerns in space of various types, you know, um, and I think I think that you can you can really see that science fiction is doing imperial dream work during that early period, uh, you know, in the 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 late 1800s, the early 1900s, in, in a variety of ways. Now, more sophisticated science fiction writers are are kind of both doing imperial imagining and challenging imperial imagining, like uh um you know hg wells for example right you know hg wells on some in in some moments like with war of the worlds is profoundly challenging right uh, uh british imperialism right you know in war of the worlds we have like a, a story that says imagine british reader what it would be like if a foreign foe right martians right with uh, tremendously superior technological power were to come and do to you exactly what we are doing to uh to native people in tasmania for example right like that's kind of you know one of his uh one of his key arguments there but at the same time you know uh and other places wells is uh unabashedly kind of bought into uh colonial paradigms of development right uh of technologically superior culturally inferior right like you know if you look at the time machine uh you know his 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 notion of like uh how how people are advanced or 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 stunted as, as groups or civilizations is profoundly kind of colonialist in its sort of attitudes in various ways um and bought into all this sort of evolutionary stuff you know and so my argument would be like prior to the 1960s like science fiction is entangled with colonial fantasy imperial and colonial fantasy very deeply you know burroughs being one of the big examples right like you know mars is the american west right uh, with john carter and all that um and it's going to be a place where you know western manly heroes can go and you know regenerate their virility right uh, re repeating all these kinds of like familiar toxic kind of like violent uh uh patterns or tendencies that we saw in American Westerns, right, for, for many, many uh, decades, if not centuries, right? Um, I think that there's a change that happens. My, my book argues, I think that there's a change that happens in science fiction in the 1960s, because I think that um, by the time you get 
to the end of World War II, you go through this period of decolonization after, you know, after World War II, and as you move into the 50s and 60s, like imperialism is a bad word, right, after World War II, right? Uh, prior to World War II, people can get behind, well, let's go out and do the project of empire, and we can feel good about that. After World War II, and after, you know, a, a variety of, you know, complicated and, inter in, you know, intricate, like decolonization movements and things like that that are happening, like, you know, we, we shift to a moment, especially by the 1960s, where you're like, the imperialists are the bad guys, right? Kind of like Shuri says in the Black Panther movie, right? Uh, get away from me, colonizer, right? You know, uh, co like imperialists are the bad guys, right? Uh, by that time, decisively. And so one of the things that I think happens in the 1960s is that anti-imperial sentiments become very, very, very profoundly articulated in science fiction, right? Like we're all the rebels fighting against the empire in science fiction, not all, but like we're predominantly, right? Like uh, invited to be on the side of the rebels fighting against the empire uh, from the 1960s forward, rather than it's very rare that you get science fiction. I mean, there are some right-wing science fiction writers and some militaristic science fiction writers that continue to champion, con you know, to, to champion conquest, right? But for the most part, I think the, the overwhelming tendency after the 1960s is to, to tell stories that imagine us to be the rebels, right, uh, fighting the empire or uh, the the neo and the resistant movement, uh, resistance movement, unplugging from the matrix and decolonizing consciousness or whatever. Yeah. So much to think about there, right? You know, Gene Roddenberry starts as a writer for Wagon Train, right, before right. he writes for Star Trek, right? It's Wagon Train to the Stars, I think, is his sales pitch. Um, you know, all the way to sort of current work like Firefly, right, where we are the resistance against the central power, um, freedom loving, but they're also the lost cause Confederates, right? right, against the union, the centralized union, right? I mean, it, it's so deeply romanticized and 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 you get emotionally attached, but at the same time, you're like, oh my God, who am I cheering for here? Yeah. Um, it, it feels to me at times. I, I think if you could take sort of a moment and sort of expand on your, your work with these ideas of alt victimhood and reverse colonization and how that plays into this sort of history of science fiction and colonial, colonial imagination. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, you know, if one part of the story is that, you know, from the 1960s forward, I think, right, science fiction decisively turns toward saying empire is bad, right? Uh, and the heroes are going to be those who are fighting against empire rather than the agents of empire. Um, I mean, that it's it's uneven. So like some some science fiction is more is doing that more than others, of course, right? But if, if that becomes your overall tendency, then um, I think what you start to see are reverse colonization narratives, right, um, become ubiquitous within science fiction. And so that's stories that are like Wells's earlier War of the Worlds, you know, that are on some level inviting you to imagine what it's like to be on the receiving end of empire, or you imagining what it's like to be the victim, the colonized subject, et cetera, et cetera like the prisoner, as we just saw, right? Imagine what it is to be the administered subject, right? Uh, imagine what it is to be the prisoner. Imagine what it is to be trapped uh, in this world, dominated, right? Fighting against the man, uh, and the man is very vague. It can be pretty much everything, right? Um, you know, I, I, I argue that I think that um, reverse colonization narratives become one of, if not the most sort of central strain of science fiction, particularly popular science fiction moving forward, uh, you know, from the 60s on. And um, in some ways, that's awesome, because it invites everyone to sort of go like, oh, here, what are the ways that uh, empire is operating to the detriment of, you know, how, how are people being uh, oppressed and like, you know, subject to various forms of military violence, economic violence, like, like, let, let's pay attention to, I mean, even Star Trek, right, uh, is, is like, 
keenly paying attention to uh i mean there's the whole thing with the prime directive right like let's be careful about interfering in like let's not just roll in you know blast blasters blazing right and uh, uh and influence other cultures to our own ends let's try to at least pay lip service to right some other kind of model where there's like an exploration of space that's not necessarily about military conquest so i mean even star, star trek is like wrestling with this problem um where you get into alt victimhood is I, you know, like when I, I always say, like in leading up to writing this book, when I was teaching War of the Worlds with my students, you know, I, I started to notice an interesting division in their responses. You know, my students, most of my students would be like, oh, wow, I get it, right? Like, uh, like Wells is trying to say, uh, wouldn't it suck to be on the receiving end of Imperial Conquest? But then I would always have a couple of students who'd be like, I didn't get that at all. This made me like scared and thinking about like, if that were to really happen, I need to take up arms. Like I want to go buy a gun and be ready to defend myself if someone comes and does this to me. And I was like, oh, right. So the way these stories land with people can be profoundly different depending on where they're sitting and how they're, um, and how they're, how they're, you know, like the reception is very complicated, right? And, uh, you know, what I then started to see was that there are all sorts of uh, predominantly white masculine science fiction readers who have become major voices and uh, presences within the reactionary right um, and who are using science fiction um, and science fictional tropes and science fictional references as part of the way that they like approach the world, right? You know, the the one of the biggest examples would be all of the sort of red pill, black pill discourse in the alt-right uh, which says, oh yeah, like Neo, we need to take the red pill and check out of the illusionary world that is trying to colonize our minds with uh, feminism and anti-masculine sentiment and multiculturalism and liberal nonsense. Like this is all, this is an effort to dominate and control us. And we're going to take the red pill and be like Neo and check out of that so that we can then, you know, wage war against the forces that are colonizing us. And, you know, the, the fact that you can take a film that's written by, you know, that, that it, there's the, the fact that that film, which is also like the, the Matrix, which is also sort of taken as an icon of trans politics and LGBT politics in certain kinds of ways can also be like one of the launching points for like incels and anti-feminists is sort of says something about the way that science fiction is profoundly functioning uh, at, at weird multiple purposes in our contemporary moment. Sorry, I went on for a long time there. I apologize. <laughs> oh, oh no, it's, you know, uh, no, no problem at all. Um, really, really sort of rich topics to think about. I think I want to bookmark um, the right because I think the story of of incels and the right co optation is really important for us to to come back to. Uh, but before we lose sort of um, before we lose your book particularly in in current politics i also think um you know you, we we've talked we've started throwing around terms reverse colonization and alt victimhood um and i think you have such a your book the terms you have invented for your book are so evocative and rich and and i enjoy them right the black iron prison reverse colonization alt victimhood imperial masochism I just, you know, and then psychedelic masculinity, you know, these terms I think are are really rich and and get are are really handy. They're a handy toolkit to get at some of at, at a lot of these issues. So I'm wondering if you would sort of walk us through some of your terms as a way to walk us through some of your analysis and then and then then, you know, let let's play with the scary new right political monster elephant in the room. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll say thank you, and, and um, I appreciate that you uh, that the terms uh, sort of work for you. Um, the Black Iron Prison is actually Philip K. Dick's term from uh, his exegesis. That was, but I mean, so to go along with the whole prisoner thing, right? Like Philip K. Dick 
like had this he, he we could talk about him for forever but he had this weird like psychedelic mental breakdown late in his life and he he came to believe that we were all like uh in this thing this amorphous structure of existential domination called the black iron prison that he would call the black iron prison or the bip um and you know so he very much like the prisoner in the television show right was is like oh we are all you know, we are all prisoners. We have all been like reality itself has been constructed to oppress us. Uh, and here you are, Philip K. Dick, you know, reasonably affluent Northern California white dude, right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so there, so that's 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 a term from him. In terms of my terms, um, you know, so reverse colonization, I think we kind of talked about. I think reverse colonization narratives are ones that uh, and that's not even actually my term specifically either, but I'm 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 adapting some of other scholars have talked about it and other people have talked about it to say reverse colonization story is a story that invites you to imagine yourself as the victim rather than the perpetrator in some sort of context often an imperial context right you know uh, like so star wars right like imagine that you are the empire uh, or that you are the rebel alliance fighting the empire when if you really look around in the audience you're probably part of the empire right so that's a reverse colonization story um all victimhood uh, wonderfully, that's I, I. I have to give credit where credit is due. That that wasn't originally in the book, um, but after I turned it into um, the editors at the University of Iowa, they were trying to come up with a great term in the title, and they were like "alt victimhood," and I'm like, "Oh, you're so good, right?" Like I wish that I had thought of that. I wish that I could claim that, but it was the team, the the team working on the cover and the title came up with that. But yeah, alt victimhood would be like the way that. Um, the way that subjects of privilege imagine themselves as oppressed victims by drawing on right these kinds of uh, reverse colonization stories, not just as like fun entertainment, but as like, yeah, that's what's really happening, right? Like I really am the victim here. So and I, I think it kind of points towards the alt-right and the reactionary right, their sort of appropriation of victimhood. I think of a lot of what President Trump does is engaging in alt-victim. Wow. Right. You know, like you are a rich. Sorry, not to get into the contemporary right, but like, uh, you know, here you are one of the richest, most powerful people in the world. And you are constantly, 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 um, you know, um, crying about what a victim you are in order to gain political power from that victim. I mean, I saw this whole thing, but, um, Imperial masochism, uh, I like as a term. So that's, uh, you know, which, which would, would be to say. Imperial masochism is a term I use to, to sort of point toward the pleasure of identifying as a victim. Um, and it's not to uh, not not to be confused with, I think, other forms of erotic masochism, which are like uh, much more, much more kind of beautiful and complicated. And some people have kind of critiqued me. They're like, you're, you're giving masochism a bad name. I'm like, fair, totally. Right. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, I want to say that, uh, like, I think that the kind of pleasure of resentment in the Nietzschean sense, the pleasure of like the way that there's a deep like jouissance to like, I am the victim here. And that means that I get to do whatever I want, right? That means that I get to lash out at these liberals who are silencing me, or I get to lash out at uh, these feminists who would dare to right try to take over my world or whatever, right? Like, so imperial masochism, the pleasure of being the victim right the the perverse uh and not, again not to give perversity a bad name but the like the kind of perverse pleasure uh of of imagining oneself as being victimized and in pain and subject to all of that so um that's uh imperial masochism and then um psychedelic masculinity i think really is specifically kind of came out of my reading of dune but i think that you can also see it in um the matrix and in a variety of other places uh, would be kind of stories where, yeah, stories where like, whoa, I need to free my mind, take the red pill, you know, like do the spice or whatever and have this like awakening to, right, uh, the deep power that I have been denied uh, as a man in whatever, like it, it's like a, a moment of psychedelic epiphany or awakening um, that is that is an awakening to a reclaiming of masculine power and superiority, right? Uh, I think you see this very profoundly in Dune, right? Take the psychedelic and become the, the, the most powerful sort of like super mensch in all of existence. You kind of see this in 2001, A Space Odyssey, right? Like Dave Bowman, like, whoa, he expands his mind through the monolith and all that, and then becomes like this masterful, masterful God subject. 
Um, there's a lot to be said about right. Uh, there's a lot to be said about threatened masculinity in in the late 20th century. A sense of threatened masculinity. Uh, the reality, I don't, I don't know if there's anything about that, but a a, 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 a reactionary feeling of masculinity's dominance being threatened. Um, and these kinds of stories, like The Matrix, where it's like, whoa, or, you know, once I wake up and free my mind from whatever has been colonizing me and limiting me, then now I can become uh, this uh, this sort of like powerful Superman figure. Yeah, we should all thank our we should all be thankful for good editors, right? Who give us great terms. Totally, um, yeah. You know, um, they deserve all praise and recognition. Uh, we did two months ago when Yenny Bonivier was on the show. We we ended up we did end up talking about uh, the Hugos and and Puppygate, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but I think you know and that circles around to the sort of you know the way the way you analyze how the political alt right nationally and globally right have taken some of these stories to heart. Um, you know I'm thinking of Giorgia Maloney the far right prime minister in Italy, who as a youth went to Hobbit camp, you know, as a young budding fascist loves Tolkien and Tolkien is incredibly popular in the Italian far right yeah. um, for immigration reasons, right? Tolkien, Tolkien and those swarthy Easterners or the orcs are all bad because they are not because they're individually bad, but because they're orcs, right? Yeah. To defend our Mediterranean border not from individuals, but from all Africans, right? I and mean, there's a really interesting way in which globally, it's not just a US science fiction story, uh, but you have walked through a lot of really interesting examples. Um, I also think of Bezos, right? Jeff Bezos, who loves Star Trek, models himself on Picard, saved, thankfully, I'm glad he saved the expanse, but you know, uh, what are some who are some of the other folks that you are, are looking at? What are some of the other ways that the contemporary political alt right has brought this into their camp? What what often from the 60s on people assumed was sort of a liberal left perspective or, you know, genre? Yeah. Well, it's very widespread, right? The 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 use of like as you kind of point out uh, in in the uh, example of Italy, like the the use of science fiction, right? Uh, the use of what many would consider to be progressive is science fiction in other contexts or fantasy, progressive fantasy in other contexts, uh, for these sorts of reactionary purposes is really widespread. It happens all over the place, right? Um, one of the things that I look at is, I mean, uh, it's 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 difficult to like with so many reactionary mass shooters, right, uh, that we see in our contemporary moment, it doesn't take much digging to find them self-imagining as science fiction people, right? Uh, so in the book, I write about um, Elliot Roger, who is kind of like an icon in the incel movement. He went on a shooting rampage um, in uh, Isla Vista. Um, you know, he, he basically like... Uh, yeah, he 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 decided that. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to be there's a lot to be said here, but like there a, a number of incels, right, uh, which are involuntary celibates, people who believe men men who believe that um, you know uh, women are victimizing them by choosing not to sleep with them, right? Uh, you know, there have been a number of mass shooters, right, and and there's a profound reliance on science fictional uh reverse colonization type narratives and ways of thinking i got a whole chapter about this uh in the book more recently this was really disturbing i didn't write about this in the book but i thought i might um sort of share it with you i, I mean like literally honestly almost every time that there's a mass shooting i go um i go and i i sort of look at at the person a little bit more closely in terms of their um motivations and you just stumble into science fiction things all the time right video especially references to video games in uh, 2021, right, uh, in December of 2021, there was a shooting in Denver, um, and I went down the rabbit hole of this one, which was madness. The shooter, uh, his name was Lyndon McLeod. Uh, he was an alt-right, masculine supremacist, anti-feminist, anti-feminist conspiracy dude. 
and he went on this shooting rampage in Denver. And, you know, so I take a look and I discover that this this guy self-published online a trilogy of science fiction novels under the pseudonym Roman McClay, in which the main character uh, named Lyndon, which is his actual name, goes on a killing rampage and murders the same people with the same names that he then murdered in real life during his shooting rampage. So this is a dude who wrote a, a trilogy of science fiction novels about a killing rampage that he actually went on. Um, and then you're like, okay, so what, what was the science fiction trilogy? Well, Amazon removed those novels, so you can't buy them. I haven't read them, but um, Google and Goodreads offer some hints about his trilogy. Uh, and one of the reviewers says, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. How does one begin to describe a masterwork such as Sanction? Impossible. You must experience. It's an epic, visceral journey into the dark heart of every man broken by society, the one chewed up and spit out. What if a man were to put his foot down, stand up and bellow out with brain and balls and bile, not one more inch? And you could just see it like, I am not a number. I am a free man, right? Uh, now, it, I, it's terrible to laugh. Like, at the, I, I, I also feel inclined to laugh. And then I'm also, and this this person killed people, right? Uh, so, you know, on, on the sort of day-to-day -day level, there are, and then it gets even worse, too, because I, I, I went further. I haven't written about this yet. I sort of started looking at people who interviewed him for podcasts. There's a whole manosphere group of people who were like, oh, your books are so great. Why don't we interview you and, and we'll talk with you and broadcast your signal. And this led me directly into groups online that are like, you feel you you reader feel like something is wrong we have a training set of modules you can join us uh, and we will show you how to reclaim your masculinity. It'll only be $100 a month, right? Uh, and then you can join our community uh, and we will show you how to take back your manhood. And this, these are literally like groups online that are radicalizing uh, disaffected men um, to like become shooters, right? Uh, I mean, they they would deny that uh, sort of like publicly, but that's that's literally like you can find like radicalization uh, training programs and and groups like this that you can that you can join online. And they were celebrating him left and right. Uh, there was a podcast with someone named Hunter Drew. He has a show called The Family Alpha. And he was talking with McClay, right, uh, about sanction chapter by chapter. Uh, Hunter Drew is actually a name for a dude named Zachary Small, who dedicates a site, who runs a site dedicated to helping men get in touch with their masculinity so that they can be alpha fathers, right? Uh, so, I mean, this this stuff is, this is, this is science fiction is run, is, is sort of driving the kind of self-identification discourse, the ways in which people people are able to frame themselves as victims uh, in the black iron prison of liberal society that is, you know, emasculating us uh, and taking away our power and all that kind of stuff. So literally in terms of the alt-right, like the alt-right, you know, the kind of fringe alt-right on the internet, uh, you you have those kinds of things. But I think it's, it's it, as time has passed, it's, it, it's harder to even talk about the alt-right because the alt-right has become in many cases, the mainstream right. You know, uh, you're not far from the. It's not. It's not a huge jump from these kinds of things to Tucker Carlson, right? Uh, it really. It really isn't. You know, and so I'm not. I'm not trying to kind of like slam on everyone who is a right wing thinker at all. But I like the alt rights takeover of the mainstream right, uh, and the way that these uh, kinds of like uh, the way that these kinds of science fictionalized sort of self understandings have kind of taken over in the the mainstream right is also pretty profound. Yes, it sort of makes a person nostalgic for when we had Robert Bly to complain about. And so true. Yeah. Um, there, there is, I think, a really fascinating way in which this niche is fed by the mainstream, right? The mainstream opens up these these places for sort of the niche to go further. Um, I want to I want to open up to uh, one of our one of the fellow collectives. Joe would like to ask a question, and then so I want to open up, but I want to get back to also some questions about popular culture and the right as we move forward. But Joe, please step in. Oh sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, no, this is going really great. Thank you both. Uh, my camera's off because I'm doing some childcare duty here, but it's really great to have you here, David. So my question, which I think maybe is good to come in at this time. Um, is about, I mean, different ways to come at it, but one would be to what degree can we think of masculinity as kind of a form and even a contested form, 
not only a kind of a content and and, and, in, and even in, in a sense, kind of certain notions of uh, gendered expression of crisis. I'm thinking here about basically the undeniable fact that we do have a growing sector, though I don't want to exaggerate it, but a growing sector of the white working class population of all, of course, of all genders, but but that has been experiencing really acute, um, intense uh, material anxiety, right? Not only relative competition with other groups that might be doing better relatively, you know, and so forth, but in, in absolute terms and how that may factor into the, the possibility of reading some figurations here, not the ones you're mentioning, some of which I know and agree with you and some of which I don't know and defer. But I'm thinking about like a text much derided for various reasons, like Avatar. And I haven't seen the new one, so feel free to spoil or not spoil. But I, I have been one of these people, even in my Marxist circles, you know, who basically like push back on the idea that you can just dismiss this kind of imperial traitor narrative of Avatar as just, you know, what dances with wolves with smurfs although even i think dances with wolves shouldn't be at least in the 90s i was a kid in the 90s watching that identifying with the the race traitor narrative now i'm not saying these are innocent narratives and i'm thinking about the hunger games is another one which i think is very very much like up for grabs right i feel like there's a lot of rightists you know folks on the right that have you know claimed the small town virtue of that against the city but i'm kind of curious about avatar as just one example and maybe others that you think of about the way in which we might see the kind of a broken male figure, in this case, a soldier, right? Who's kind of, it, this is coming out not that long after the first Avatar movie, right? The main character, right? Lost his leg, use of his legs. You know, it's I think it's in Venezuela, right? Th that, that the war is supposed to have happened. And so I'm kind of wondering about the way, how you read that film, but also more generally just this kind of possibility of a kind of struggle over you know, is it possible there could be an anti-imperialist kind of appropriation or that there are anti-imperialist contestations of kind of beleaguered white masculinity and that maybe the left should, you know, uh, I don't know what that means for for how we approach these as critics and also the political opportunities. I'm kind of, as you can probably hear, like wary of kind of pushing, you know, some folks that may break right, like kind of enabling that by kind of right, reading what's going on simply as just like inherently reactionary as opposed to more contested. So I'll just stop there. But uh, this is like a great discussion and I hope I'm contributing to it, not derailing it. Not at all, Joe. Those are great comments and a lot of things that I think about too. Uh, uh, I Part of what I kind of got into when I was writing this book is like, all of these texts are profoundly contested, right? Like Avatar, you're you're right. Like on one hand, this and some people, what some people take away from it and and feel into around it and all the rest of that is like a profoundly like ecologically aware sort of like anti-imperial, anti kind of like corporate, anti-capitalist sentiment. And some people are driven, right? Like in in that way toward it, right? Um, but then on another, you know, the, then at other times you're like, yeah, so then we've got the sort of like, you know, leather stocking almost like, you know, you, you, you sort of like white savior narrative, like some white savior helping the local natives narrative. And, and it's, it's all in there, right. Uh, you know, in, in, in various ways, I don't think these texts are inherently, I think so many of these texts, part of it is like, uh, uh, they're not inherently one thing or another. Sometimes they're trying to be one thing and are deeply appropriatable to be something else because ultimately you have very little control over how texts are received by, just like I was saying with War of the Worlds, right? Like uh, uh, we don't, you know, like authors and even teachers, we don't really control how texts are received. When I think about this, I often think about, you know, Scott McCloud in his book, um, Understanding Comics, he talks about icons and he says, you know, the more you simplify, uh, the more you amplify. So, you know, if you have just a, like a cartoon with a, a smiley face that has nothing but a circle and two eyes and a happy mouth, like there's profound ways that people can um, pour themselves into that representation uh, and identify with it because of its simplicity. But the more complicated you make it, if you make it, a, 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 you know, like if you give it color, if you give it detail, if you give it gender, then there's less room for, there's less immediate room for identification. And so when I think about the question of identification, which is I think what you're really kind of pointing at here, I, I, I kind of go like the more 
mythical and iconic some of these stories are, the more perversely appropriatable they become, right? Uh, so, you know, like Neo in the Matrix uh, is like unplugging from the Matrix and like fighting the system. But the system is kind of a big, vague thing there that we can pour a lot of different kinds of uh, meanings and associations on, right? So uh, that leads to, you know, some people being like, well, the system is feminism. Uh, well, oh God, right? Like, uh, you know, and so one argument would be that that these kinds of these kinds of counter imperialist, counter capitalist, counter, you know, uh, like the, the, these sorts of science fictions that want to take aim at something need to be a bit more specific in terms of what they're taking aim at and who is the one who is standing up? You know, a lot of people have, have said to me, they're like, isn't it a lot harder when it's Michael Burnham in uh, Discovery than when it's Neo in the Matrix for like, it's it's hard for your, your alt-right dudes who are anti-feminists to be like, yeah, Commander Burnham, she's who I, I just totally imagine myself in her shoes. Yeah, that's harder, right? Uh, and so the, the actual politics of representation come into play here really, really powerfully. There's so much to say there, right? Uh, great, great comment, great question thank you yeah i mean sort of moving forward i think the the sort of i think there's a long history here right i mean i think larry may talks about how hollywood learned to write to both ends of the political spectrum very early on in the 20s and 30s right jimmy stewart goes to washington can be loved by the new deal liberals and by the anti-state small government anti-New Deal dealers, right? I mean, they, they figured this out early on and I think have continued to 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 make hay in this field, as it were. Uh, you know, lately I find myself watching science fiction TV particularly and, and, and in the back of my mind, I didn't used to do this a decade ago, right? But now I'm, I'm watching shows thinking, could I watch this show and feel good about it if I stormed the Capitol on January 6th? If I'm a proud boy who believes in, you know, bodily autonomy and, and ascetic livelihood. Um, and I think you started getting at this, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear a little more. Are there particular kinds of story elements or pieces that make it harder for the right to co-opt beyond a specificity, right? I mean, Andor has gotten a lot of attention and there's a lot of me that feels like, yeah, I could watch this as a proud, maybe not a proud boy because there's a lesbian couple, right? And that kind of violates the proud boys, but maybe as an Oath Keeper, I could watch this, right? Um, but, you know, Andor, Andor has a lot of freedom, but very little economics, right? Pretty much everybody can be pro-freedom. Um, but there's not a lot of economic redistribution in that revolution um, yet, at least that I've seen so far, right? Or um, DS9, which tends to be my favorite Star Trek, I feel like it's it's less co-optable for various reasons than that Star Trek Enterprise reboot, right? Where Earth was resentful that they were behind, right? Um, yeah. What are the elements that, that feed the right? And what are some of the elements that might resist easy co-optation? I, I went on too long there, um, but does that make sense? It totally does, yeah. No, I it, that, that absolutely makes sense. And I think, you know, I think that it, we're in a really interesting moment right now um, when it comes to, because uh, I, I would agree with you, I think that that politically neutral multi-coding that you kind of talk about from, you know, the 1930s, uh, has been um, really present in a lot of different kinds of mainstream science fiction, right, and fantasy and shows like that. And I think that we're sort of at a crossroads with that where that's becoming less possible, right? Uh, I think, you know, it, as much as you might, as much as we might say that uh, that these shows are still multi-coded or politically neutral or or not neutral, like trying to play to all audiences. I think that is becoming actually difficult for Disney uh, to play to all audiences. And I think that Disney might be tepidly moving in the direction of like it's uh, of, of taking liberal stances from some perspectives, but from other perspectives, they're taking a pretty strong stance towards uh, towards those liberal like kinds of representations. Enough that you've got Nazis 
uh, uh, like flying actual swastikas outside of Disney, right? Uh, Disney World, and you've got you know Ron DeSantis like taking on Disney uh, full bore, right? Like let's go to war here, right? Uh, so I mean, I think that a lot of the new Marvel and Disney, Marvel and Star Wars shows are much less difficult for uh, Proud Boys and Oath Keepers to like pour themselves into um, in terms of identification. And that's because like Disney is, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be like a Disney apologist here by any means, but like they're, they're, they're doubling down on questions of representation, right? Uh, we are going to have black men and women um, in these major roles. We are going to show uh, lesbian, gay, queer relationships of various types. You know, on Star Trek Discovery, we're going to have prominent non-binary characters going through gender transitions. You know what I mean? Like, the, and, and it's like, when it's that, when when the cultural politics, you're right that the economics are perhaps not as advanced in terms of their things. But when the, when you're when you're paying attention to the politics of representation uh, with those kind with that kind of specificity, it becomes a lot harder to pour yourself into the everyman rebel fighting against the empire, right? Like it's like, oh, can I identify with? Uh, you know, a, a black female mermaid, right? Uh, well, uh, you know, like for some people, there is a there's a much there's a there's a, a deeper barrier to identification if what you are is deeply opposed to that thing, right? So again, I'm not trying to overstate. I'm not trying to to like hold up Disney as an icon of you know uh, progressive left politics or anything like that because they're certainly not. Um, and I think that the economics are are more complicated, but um, but I think that the 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 politics of actual casting and representation um, are are such now that it is profoundly more difficult for um, for those right wing reactionary figures to they hate Disney right like more than anybody on the left does <laughs> at this point <laughs> like the left may be critical of Disney uh, and it's like failure to be like you know progressive enough but our but the the left's hatred of Disney does not does not even begin to uh, to match you know uh, DeSantis's hatred of Disney for for its for what they perceive as its leftward sort of drift in politics so you know yeah. <laughs> and Andor, for what it's worth, Andor, I mean, you have a, you've got a workers revolution happening in Andor, you know what I mean? Like, you're right that it's, 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 uh, it's approach to uh, economic redistribution has limits, right? Uh, but you do see, uh, like, a w w in, even in season one, you do have a, a workers uprising against the sort of, like, extractive forces of, right, uh, capital and, and a profound sort of, like, a, a strong sort of uh, paying attention to um, extract right uh like uh ecological extraction you know um, in a way that's sort of like you know like uh like avatar you know in in some ways so uh you know yeah i think it's i think it's a lot harder right at that point yeah andor andor is my favorite of of all of them so far right i wasn't picking on a straw man when i picked andor yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, you know um and i think andor has a lot of of possibility and i'm hoping that that it continues to develop its sort of possibility. Um, but I, I like the I like the point that it, it's harder for the sort of alt right to identify with a black non binary black non binary mermaid um, than Captain Kirk, right, in terms of who's moving out into the stars. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, it, it sort of makes me think there are ways in which um, stories that question those sort of hard boundaries of the individual body right are are much more difficult stories that question that sort of individual autonomy are much more difficult for the right to pick up yeah um and i think i want to we're we're getting close to the end and i want to let you also talk about your other book moving or moving from questions of bodily boundaries and autonomy right to ancillary justice by Anne Leckie, which to me, that's one of the great things about that book is the question of the bounded individual is just blown out of the water by Leckie, mm -hmm. um, right, with, with uh, but I would, I would love you to have a chance to sort of talk about your recent book um, and to talk a little bit about uh, ancillary justice in the context of sort of Leckie's larger work. I know you've got a review coming out in the LA Review of Books of her latest work that I've just really happily started on your recommendation. Um, so tell us a little bit about sort of Leckie and what you're doing in, in, the, in the book on ancillary justice. 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just to, to go back to, to one point before I launch into Lucky, I, I guess uh, like a little coda, I would say on that to Joe's point earlier is uh, it may be that the more specific uh, people like Disney become with things like, you know, uh, representation around uh, gender and race, uh, the more you may, uh, the more that the right may be able to grab people who are disaffected, right, and and uh, uh, and mobilize people who are disaffected more around class, right, uh, which I think is the is is more complicated, right? Like uh, there there was a way in which everyone in the Matrix could have like that that like the the economic you know the 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 kind of material anxieties that Joe was talking about, right? That sort of you know caused people to to kind of go like, okay, so I see myself in this revolutionary because my circumstances are changing. Right. Uh, I think that some of those people are being kind of swooped into the right because they feel like because the right is finding ways to, to reach out to them and say, oh, look, the left doesn't care about you because they care about black people or whatever, which is really, really messed up, like in all kinds of ways. So anyway, just I was thinking about Joe's point and I didn't really address that, that bit about the way that these stories have or haven't been able to sort of get to class anxiety and economic anxiety. So, Joe, I. And Anyway, you, you had a lot of good, important stuff to say there. Um, as for Anne Leckie, uh, I am such a fan of Anne Leckie. Uh, she's just amazing, right? Uh, I, I've, I've been really privileged. She let me interview her. She let me have a long, beautiful, slow motion email interview with her a couple of times. And she's so gracious. Um, I think that Anne Leckie, I would say, I don't know, people would probably fight with me on this, but I think Anne Leckie is the Ursula K. Le, K. Le Guin of our moment, right? In terms of the richness of her um her science fictional imaginings particularly if you were to sort of do a parallel between like um Le Guin's Hainish novels right uh Left Hand of Darkness which were all about kind of like all right are we going to be an empire or are we going to try to figure out some other way of doing right like like connection between people in a grand space opera um and then Lucky's ancillary justice works or her imperial ratch works um, so yeah, her her books are, I think, some of the just some of the richest and most thoughtful, the most theoretically sophisticated uh, approaches to questions like empire and the way that it affects us all on our day to day lives uh, and our complicity within um, its its unfolding operations. Uh, you know, um, questions about gender and race and how the state produces race as a category of legal existence through giving or withholding citizenship in various ways. Uh, so, and, and also between Ancillary Justice, which was released now 10 years ago, this is the 10 year anniversary of Ancillary Justice, and her new book, Translation State, I think that there's some really extraordinary advances in, in her thinking about um, gender uh, and uh, alternate categories of gendered identity. Um, so, you know, from uh, agendered kinds of ways of, of thinking and representing characters to uh, trans and non-binary ways of, uh, of, of expressing characters. You know, her newest book, Translation State, is I think one of the, the most beautiful uh, commentaries on the importance of taking pronouns seriously. Uh, like, I mean, the, the I, I won't spoil too much of that book because we don't have much time left anyway, but I would, I, it would basically be like, I think one way of summing up that book is to say like, if you are not able to like respect someone's pronouns, right? You are not, you are dismissing their personhood uh, and their identity in in ways that have legal and military and social and economic systems of power built into your ability to either get away with that or not. Uh, and it's just breathtaking, right? Like watching her lay that all out in the most charming kind of way, right? So there's my there's my plug for Anne Lucky. I think she's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I I completely agree. Um, uh, yes, and I am so looking forward to finishing translation state and 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 really really respect ancillary justice. And I will have to think of her in context with Ursula K. Le Guin because that is very high praise uh, to compare a person with Ursula K. Le Guin at her height. Um, I think the big difference is like like that Anne Leckie is such a she's so like I 
uh, like working class and like humble in 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 her sentiments, right? Like the the biggest difference I would say between them, even though I think they're thinking about very similar things and approaching them with and doing space opera and having such theoretical sophistication, you know, like um, like Le Guin was sort of an academic in in her her way of approaching things, whereas like Lecky is like really like just a down to earth human thinking about complicated stuff and trying to then trying to to find ways to express that um but one of the things that you then get in her characters are like profoundly down to earth people who are just trying to do the right thing and sometimes taking small actions here and there can lead to toppling empires right uh and i really love that about her yeah um, you know, we have time. I'd I'd love to wrap up with just a couple of questions. Uh, but you know, I think um you are you are a passionate fan, um obviously in this interview and, and it warms my heart, right? And you are also, you know, an academic scholar and a critic, um, and you're also an activist. Um, how do you, what are the relationships for you personally between being a, a science fiction, speculative fiction fan, consumer, critic, and, and, and social activist? Mm, yeah. Wow, great question. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess what I would say is that all of those things seem like one thing to me uh, in the sense that Hmm, I don't know. The art that I love has shaped who I am. Uh, thinking deeply about that art and sharing uh, my perspectives on that art with others who are passionately engaged, right, is is a great joy. Um, and, you know, I, I think that like what what has drawn me to speculative fiction in in so many ways is like it imagines different kinds of possibilities in the world right i mean it's sort of cliche to say right in some ways but like this is the old the, the all, all of the old arguments about why science fiction is special right like it, it causes us to stop taking for granted the way that the world is and perhaps to imagine other ways that it could be or to look more closely at why it is the way that it is and and all of that and so when it comes to activism i i think that um you know it, it's like uh, sometimes these these works of art change my sense of myself. Some often they make me want to go out and do things in the world. Uh, a lot of times, using references to those things can help you connect with other people who want to do those things in the world. You know what I mean? So I I think that that's uh, all of those things are of a piece. Sadly, it's also the case that they are connected for the reactionary right wingers as well. Right? They're similarly so, so like science fiction on some level has become like almost the only common ground in in our popular culture right popular culture has become so like like we just don't have abc nbc cbs the, the way that we did when i was a kid right like we don't have a mainstream media anymore we have niche medias of a million different types and um if there's anything that counts as mainstream media anymore it's like it is the the things that we we have fandoms around that's like that's where people meet and engage and feel passionately and share like you know uh water whatever the current version of water 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 cooler conversations would be which is i suppose like facebook conversations and tiktok videos and all the rest right um and so i don't know like there there's a way in which like um science fiction i, I think speculative fiction popular culture um has a profound ability of a profound capability to mobilize right people uh for good and for ill uh would be one of the things that i would say because i i'm not i'm not blind to the fact that there's a lot of like right-wing activists who like you know stormed the capital because they thought of themselves as being rebels fighting against the empire you know what i mean like uh so those are that's a different kind of activism and it is similarly um driven by uh passionate engagement with speculative fantasy you know what i mean so yeah do you have any any sort of um personal experience thinking about your activism and science fiction sort of on the ground are there are there i mean i know you have been you know you have been sort of a social activist you've gotten out in the streets are there are there some concrete connections for you when as you think about your feeling as um as a person whose affect has been informed by science fiction as a reason why you get out and connect with other people in terms of social change? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to think about that a little bit more. I, I'll say that 
Um, I might approach that from a slightly different angle, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. you know, I, I think that like, since, um, you know, especially since 2020, um, I was living in Minneapolis when George Floyd was murdered um, and got out on the streets to say, this is messed up. We've got to do something about this, you know, um, and, and all the rest. I mean, I had been involved with some Black Lives Matter demonstrations previous to that when Philando Castile was killed, uh, like literally down the street from my comic book store at the time. Uh, and I, I since then, I've been thinking about quite a bit through Anne Leckie actually about like, it's more like I've, I, I guess I would say more that I've thought about how science fiction helps me understand why, uh, why sometimes a protest sparks, why sometimes um, activism reaches a critical mass and does something, um, and why at other times it doesn't seem to do something, that you can go and march and uh, maybe uh, it seems like nothing is happening, even though on a deeper level maybe something is, even if you can't see it right away. Um, I think that Anne Leckie's Ancillary Justice, actually, this is kind of what drew me into writing about, um, one of the things that drew me, that most excited me about writing about Ancillary Justice is like the way that, um, so yeah, to answer your question, to, to sort of like say this a little bit more clearly, I would say looking at science fiction has helped me theorize what's actually happening with activism in a more profound way and has given me some models to build on uh, in terms of like why sometimes activism seems to make a difference, whereas at other times it, um, it, it seems to be falling flat in different ways. Um, and I say that because in Ancillary Justice and really throughout all of her works, right, you, you, you know, like Leckie's model is a person makes it, a person snaps, a person reaches a point where they just can't deal with injustice anymore, where they're, they're angry, right? Um, and they, they're pushed to the wall and they're like, I have to do something now. I have to, I, even if it means that I might waste my life away, even if it means that I might uh, suffer terrible consequences, I can't take it anymore, I've got to do something, right? Um, and, and every time someone reaches that breaking point, even if it doesn't do a lot in that moment, it will be remembered by others who may be inspired by it, or it's almost kind of like a dynamic system is reaching critical mass, and sometimes it takes time for that tension to like torque up and up and up. Um, but uh, but it, it matters, right? Like, uh, and I think that's that's one of the things that that Lucky has helped me see. It's to sort of like overcome the like paralyzing effect of cynical reason. Well, bad stuff is happening, but there's nothing I can do. Nothing I'm going to do matters, right? Lucky's really helped me see like everything you do matters, right? Um, it just might not matter in the time scale of 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 the immediate moment when when you stand up and say this is wrong. But every time you stand up and say this is wrong, uh, it matters, right? Um, and uh, it it influences others, uh, and it adds to what's happening culturally, and it and it can make a really big difference. So now, of course, then that's true for that's true for the the January sixth crowd also, right? Uh, and so what I actually get into at the end of this book on on ancillary justice is what what really then matters is um whether or not we are getting information from reliable sources uh that are communicating what is happening in our social political economic reality with any degree of truthfulness or whether or not we've gone down echo chamber rabbit holes of lies and misinformation and disinformation so the thing about science fiction and activism has sort of really pointed me into then thinking about post-truth reality and like the way that, you know, like post-truth politics and influences can be can be mobilizing people towards snapping around things. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but some of the some of the um some of the lawyers for the January 6th defendants literally had to bring in cult deprogrammers for their own clients. Like, so, all right, I'm trying to defend you, dude. Like, you raided the Capitol and, sh you know, tasered a policeman, right? Uh, and you're going to go up on the stand and spout lies and nonsense. We are, as part of your legal case, going to have to bring in a cult deprogrammer to help show you how you have been radicalized by lies, right? Uh, their own lawyers have had to do this at various times. So, you know, there's there's a lot, um, I've been thinking a lot about affect and the media and, right, like the, the way that media ecologies and media environments function, uh, because I think that that may be one of the biggest places where that can influence whether activism makes a difference or not right now. Sorry, that was kind of long. <laughs> no, no, that, that, was, that was really lovely and 
powerful and and the image of bringing in cult deprogrammers to try to make January 6th defendants defendable. I feel like we have now closed the circle and come back to the themes of the prisoner, right? The biopolitical state um, in, a, in a very perverse sort of spiraled way. Um, but, but it is sort of time that I think we begin to, to, to think about closing, but I would love it if to close us today, uh, you would suggest to audience and people uh, some of your chosen reading list for thinking about activism and social justice and you know, progressive politics. Who are, who are some of the authors that you would encourage folks to engage? Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm glad that you've asked. You know, uh, I was going to get a stack of books ready. Maybe I'll go run over here and grab them. Um, I, I would say, you know, certainly Anne Leckie is great. Um, I think N.K. Jemison's recent books, uh, her two recent New York books, The um, the City We Became and its sequel are really cool um, along these lines. Um, when you kind of sent me an early version of that question, you were like, what kind of theorists uh, do you do you find yourself engaging with? Um, and I was thinking about that and I realized I... I I love engaging with theoretical work and I and I do that qu quite a lot but these days a lot of the the writers the nonfiction writers who I find myself reading and thinking about most are more like investigative journalists uh because it's almost like the kind of you know, the, to, the cognitive mapping of what's actually going on in the present is pretty complicated right now. And sometimes I find that theorists are are missing some of the inner workings of what's going on. So actually, hold on, I'm just going to grab this really, really quick. Uh, so I found, for example, I wanted to grab these before I got here, right? Um, Catherine Stewart's book, The Power Worshippers, um, is just like a must read, right? Um, this is kind of um, about religious nationalism and uh, the kind of way that religion is working in the alt-right and the reactionary right right now. And I found myself reading this and just being like, wow, I no work of theory alone is getting is is causing my mind to explode as much as like just understanding what's actually happening over there in places that I don't have any connection with or or like only have limited kind of connection with. Um, the other one that really has jumped out to me lately, this is actually more academic, but it's it's from a different perspective. These are um, legal studies and um, internet right ecology people. Uh, Binkler, Ferris, and Roberts have this book called Network Propaganda, uh, Manipulation, Disinformation, and Radicalization in American Politics. Uh, and this really, you know, it's like uh, um, one of the things that you get into here is like, well, people say, well, you've got your echo chamber and they've got their echo chamber and everybody's got their own echo chamber. And so we're all just like fighting over, like we're all like locked in our echo chambers. Well, what they do is they, uh, they look very closely at uh, the asymmetries between different kinds of media environments and whether or not certain kinds of media environments close down lies and falsehoods and truths and punish bad actors who are right lying and spreading misinformation and other kinds of media environments that amplify and profit off of uh, the affect driven lies and falsehoods and misinformations that are kind of like, you know, moving things around. So that was a big one for me. I, I've, I've been finding less abstract theory lately, although I love theory, don't get me wrong, but I've been finding like um, people who are doing like kind of hard knuckle study of like what's going on, uh, especially in terms of like how how misinformation and disinformation spread. Um, I think that um, maybe all of us need to be looking more closely at, at that kind of work um, because I think it's pretty vital. Very cool and a wonderful challenge to all of us as readers to sort of engage information at the moment in its production. Um, David, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Such a such a joy and pleasure to get a chance to talk to you for an extended period, having you imprisoned on my computer screen um, uh, to talk with. Um, I want to remind listeners that uh, Shelter and Solidarity has a Facebook page that you can visit and help us spread the word through social media. We are all volunteers, so we do not have an advertising budget. Uh, you can also watch our shows on YouTube. Find our website at shelterandsolidarity.org. 
Uh, the Saturday bookshelf, this sub piece of Shelter and Solidarity will be continuing later in the summer or fall. Look for an announcement of our next conversation, which we expect to be with Brent Ryan Bellamy on his book, Remainders of the American Century, Post-Apocalyptic Novels in the Age of U.S. Decline, as well as his work on petrofutures and climate fiction. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors. The